Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. My column, Fura and Amala Summit, will be read to you. Before we continue with part two of my conversation with Professor Ben Wabuze, I want to introduce two of his books. The first one is President Buhari's Distinctive Legacies in Nigeria. And the other one is Further Thoughts on the Nigerian Constitution and Polity. These uh, topics are engaged in our conversation in part two of the big talk with him. After all the bluster and bites, the leopard has not only been allowed to growl in peace, it can now bite and burp. Finally, Furana Mala had a handshake. It happened in a posh setting in Abuja, although a mamaput or buka may have given it a more grassroots ambience. Especially now that both words have finagled their ways to the Oxford English Dictionary. The next word to make it to that august book is Amotekun. The Yoruba will soon lose the word to the imperial greed of the English language. It has traveled many semiotic miles. It is now verb, noun, as well as adjective, and its meaning can be nuanced, subtle, and overt. It can evoke humor, omen, and fear. Already, it threatens and promises electoral fortunes. So, why do some people say Amoteko has lost some of its potency? It is because they want psychological relief for men like the Attorney General. The Southwest governors say that they agree for laws in the states to give it a legal backing. That is the diplomatic tack some are taking on the matter. It is not right to say that because Amoteko is not written in the law book, it is therefore illegal. That point invokes two views of law that complement rather than oppose each other. One is from Apostle Paul, who says, Where there is no law, there is no transgression. The other is from the philosopher John Locke, who asserted that where there is no law, there is no freedom. The first applies to Amotekun in the sense that it works within the ambit of existing law if it is not specific. The infrastructure of security in the land is vast and allows others to help it. The law cannot say everything, so it assumes many things. What is important is not what it says, but what it expects the society to understand. That is the spirit of the law. Vigilantes are not illegal. They are not just codified in law. That is what was wrong with the letter of the Attorney General of the Federation, Abu Bakr Malami. He said he was misunderstood. He probably used the wrong language. To say something is not illegal is not the same thing as saying it is not specified in law. If he was misunderstood, he should have left that part in the press release that threatened the Amotekunites from executing their dreams. It is clear that when he says he was misunderstood, it meant he did not want confrontation. That is the root of the matter. Amoteko was not a child of rebellion, but of peace. It was birthed to protect a region from marauders in the southwest. But the controversy all started from a place of mutual distrust. It had nothing to do with whether Amoteko was in or outside the law. So, what the states are trying to do is not really to legalize Amotekun. They are trying to regularize it by codifying it. That is what Malami probably means by asking to legalize it. The proper word is to regularize. That is even a superior diplomatic tack. It is in that light that we can embrace Locke's dictum that where there is no law, there is no freedom. That was the point of compromise. It meant that it could now be placed in the ambit of the law. Amotekun is now free to operate. It is therefore more of a political move than a legal one. It is the law of liberty turning into the liberty of law. 
It is in homage to the liberty of law during the American Revolution that Benjamin Franklin cried that those who would give up essential liberty to purchase temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. What happened last week with the Fura Anamala Summit, chaired by Vice President Yemi Oshimbaju, was perhaps one of the high points of this republic. It explains how close a country can come close to collapse and how a few good men can save or wreck it. Much kudos goes to Ashiwa Jubola Tinubu's intervention that transformed the atmosphere to concord from rancor. I spoke with one of Nigeria's wise men who noted that it was the time for statescraft. Barely a day after that, we saw Tinubu's press statement with its tone of conciliation. He did not yield to hawks or doves, but advanced common sense. It was an act of courage. More importantly, an act of vision. As Solomon said, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, the result is that the leopard did not change its spots. It moved its spot to a summit of Fura and Amala. My sense of my reading of the history of that time, because I was a little boy, I didn't really know much about what was going on until I grew up and I read to understand what was, I was experiencing when I was a, a little boy, is that it was not Aburi itself, or Juku itself, or Gowan itself, himself, uh, that caused the crisis. It was a sense of distrust in the country that we could have gone through a bury without problems, would have gone through the issue of the Western region crisis without problem, but or even the issue of um, Decree 34 by Rossi, and even the coup, the suspicion of the of the of the of the majors. Uh, for creating an ethnically tendential school uh, and so on. That all those things we could have survived if there was no suspicion. Why was there this ingrained suspicion in the polity at that time? It's part of the structure of the, of the country. The rivalry, the ethnic rivalry between the North and the South. Even in the South also, you have the rivalry, the suspicion, the distrust between the Yorubas, the Igbos, and other ethnic groups in the South. There was so much distrust. The but uh, the mistake to have amalgamated such a disparate, such a diverse collection of ethnic groups into one. So that created a lot of distrust. Nobody was prepared to accept the leadership of the other in fighting. That distrust was what dominated the politics of the time. So that a bully oh, abiding by a bully was only part of the, the issue. A bully was created by that distrust in the country. Was it a symptom? Hmm? It was a symptom. It was a symptom, yes. The distrust was so all pervaded. It was so all pervaded. And um, we thought we could contain it by a bully. Whether we would have succeeded, I don't know. But it failed because there's this divergence between this saying on a bully we stand, and uh, those saying we do not accept a bully. 
space. And so the opportunity of trying to experiment on Aburi was lost. Who is to be blamed? I don't know. Was it Ojuku? Ojuku is not to be blamed until I know what well, let me say this. Um, if Aburi had been implemented, what he would have done, as I said, nobody can say, given his lust, his propensity for power. Mm. Whether he would have stopped with that bully, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And they don't blame him because they don't give him, he didn't give him the opportunity. The opportunity. To the yes. <laughs> so that is where the problem is. That is where the problem is. I listened to Gawan the other day, and I said to myself, those who advised him against implementing Aburi, played into the hands of Ojuku. They played into the hands of Ojuku. Ojuku could, you know, with a righteous mind, go away and say, ah, I accepted a bully. And I have proclaimed that a bully I stand. You didn't give me the opportunity to prove whether one month, one week, after that, I would have gone beyond the bully. Do you think that if Ojuku wanted to exploit um, Aburi, whether the intelligentsia like you, um, Okigbo, Achebe, and so on, would have given him the support? Or do you think it will have rammed its way through? Do you think the masses of of the of the of the eastern region then will have said, okay, let's go? If Ojuku had tried to exploit Aburi. The masses the two groups. The masses were very, very gullible and might have been exploited by Ojuku. Then there is what you call the intelligentsia. Hmm. We had several meetings in my house. Some of the meetings were held in my house. What Where was that? In Anugu. Anugu. Yes. In Anugu. I was in Anugu. Like Professor Ninjako. Mm. He was part of the group, Intelligentsia, mm. who wanted to stand firmly on Aburi. We knew that given Aburi, that our leader, Ojuku, might well have gone the other way, the stream. We knew that the masses might have followed him. There's nothing he could do to stop it. But we knew that taking the mood of the time, the masses might have been swept off their feet and follow the stream of Aburi. Mm. But obviously at the time when this was happening, a lot of meetings going on. Many of the meetings in my house, a few, a few, led by any Njoku. It means that uh, Aburi itself was a dangerous document. <laughs> no. In a sense. No, no, no. It was, no. It was, it was like uh, a hot plate. Yes. <laughs> It's either 
You use it to hit somebody's head, to fry somebody's face, or use it to fry egg. And so it was there. You had to decide what you wanted to do with it. And it depends on who you give, you hand it over the kitchen to. A bully, that's a position, that's a document might have given us the chance to avoid what happened. That's a bully, that's a bully, a bully, that's a document, that's an idea. Yeah. Yes. Now, what the players, Ujuku and Co, might have turned it into is another thing. And we tend to judge an idea but what the, by what the players might have done, mm. which is wrong. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I was just talking about the the potential of any document. As a constitutional uh, uh, scholar, you understand very well the capacity for language to be turned in a document into anything. Uh, in the literary studies, we call it hermeneutics. That's the reader response theory that the text itself is dead until you give it life. And it depends on what life you give, you give that text. Yes, yeah, so, so that is why even they, they call the Constitution of the United States a living document, and, that, and it depends on the actors at that time and the propensities of the judges for ideological purity or otherwise to show, to show where, where the movement of the country can go. And talking about this, I remember reading a section of Shoenka's memoirs, We Must Set Forth at Dawn, in which he talked about his encounter with Obafemi Awolowo, and that Awolowo told him about a meeting, a private meeting he had, he held with Ojuku. I think it was in Benin, in which they wanted to see whether the nation could still save itself from a coming conflagration. So the, he said he was there with some people, and Ojuku was there with a few people. They said there was a scholar. He didn't mention that scholar. I don't know if it was you. <laughs> But that when they held the meeting, it was deadlocked. Then at night, Ojuku told Awolowo that, look, chief, I have great respect for you. That's why I'm holding this meeting. There's no need for us to continue with this discussion because I cannot even go back to my people to say we are not going to war. And that as things stand, I cannot even stop them. And Ujuku, Ujuku said, uh, Awolo said Ujuku thanked him. He thanked Ujuku for his sincerity. And then he said, please, when you decide to go to war, please let me know. Of course, Ujuku is not naive. Ujuku never told him that. Does that not tell you that it was no longer, it, was, it, was, it makes it difficult for us to decide whether it, was, it is the ambition of Ujuku more than the rage of the Igbo crowd who already wanted war. That Ujuku, whether he wanted war or not, it was going to happen. My question is, did you think at that stage that it was inevitable, whether Ujuku had an ambition or not? You are putting to me a responsibility that I do not want to accept. The mood of the, of the time whether it was dictated by the masses or by Ujuku. Ujuku. Yes. 
or it was one foiling, foiling the other? No, it's either one or the other. But, um, I don't think anybody would want to come out, least of all me, to come out at this distance in time and say it should have been this or this. Mm. Uh, I followed the mood at the time. I followed the interpretations of the mood at the time. And there was a lot of manipulation, as you would expect. There's a lot of manipulation of the mood. Who manipulated the mood? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But you can guess, you can guess that it's as good as mine. <laughs> the mood was manipulated mm. to lead to a certain result, which is war. Did you think that today that that kind of sentiment is necessary. The Biafran sentiment. It was not necessary at the time any more than it is necessary today. You follow me? I get you. It was it's not, not more necessary. No. It was not necessary at the time. Mm. No. And it's not necessary today. It's not necessary today. Mm. Yes. I'm still going back to the point I made. Mm. Whether the Nigerian side, the Nigerian leaders at the time, if they had allowed Aburi to prevail, whether what happened would have happened. As I said, it's very really likely that what happened, that is, the effort, might have happened if a bully had been implemented. But if it's not implemented, and so he shifted the onus from Ojuku to the federal side. Right. Yes. And that's where. If you, again, if you ask me whether if a bully had been implemented, what happened would have happened, I would say, let's, let's, let's keep that. <laughs> I would say, no. let's keep that. Just before the program ends, this is my poem in honor of Leah Sharibu. Leah, say it's not so. That commander's sway didn't have its way. You didn't wife him. Did he bribe to bride? Manhandle to be your man? I don't believe in wife tales. Like Thomas Didymus, I must see commander, baby, and you. To see the beauty to embrace a travesty. Thank you for watching the program today. You can catch up with my published columns on www.samomashae.com. Also follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Sam And until next time, be good. <laughs>